Welcome to Bible Study for Progressives, a show where moderates, liberals, and leftists of all faiths and ideologies come together to discuss scripture, spirituality, and politics. It's your boy Javier Javier with the host and the creator of the Javier Javier Show. Make sure you say it twice. So glad to get started with my guests. We're going to sit here and discuss a few things about do you believe in belief? And I met Rich Presida. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, I heard him on Robert Stanley's podcast, The Right to Reason. And uh, needless to say, I had an opinion and we had a discussion and he decided to come on so we could discuss things a little further. As you know that you're free to make comments and I'll put the comments up there on the screen and uh, we will interact with you from time to time. So let's get them on and let's actually get things started. All right. As you know, got to play the intro. One in a million, a million, the one villain. Too hot to be in the kitchen. I'll end up melting the ceiling. What's going on, Rich? Hey, how you doing, Javier? Javier, I said it twice. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I see you. See, you got a nice background going there. It looks all majestic and holy. Yeah, yeah. I've, to basically to hide what's behind me, primarily, and to make me look okay. Good. <laughs> so I know how I can be. So uh, I want you to give the listeners a little bit of uh, background about yourself, kind of tell them who you are, anything that you want them to know about you or anything you want to promote. Okay. So I'm a progressive Christian spiritualist. So I sort of am a mix of things. I'm not purely Christian. I'm a progressive Christian. And one of the things that people might not understand is that I left the faith of my childhood. So when I was a teenager, 13, 12, I, my mom finally allowed me to go to Dodger games on Sunday and I take the bus to Dodger games. And then for a long time, I played baseball on Sundays. That was my church. I felt Sunday mornings playing baseball was my church for a long time. I studied at USC. So that was, but I had spirit. I had these spiritual experiences. I had a, huge spiritual experience at USC, but I wanted to get back to that I came to progressive Christianity later. I went to law school. I had these spiritual experiences that I, I have a few I can tell you about. And I started to try and develop them. I started to choose. I started to like dabble in different things. Right now I do media. I do Tarot, I read tarot. I'd like to learn to do mediumship. But one of my main spiritual or supernatural experiences is omens. I have omens. So what an omen is, is an omen is a prediction of a disaster or a terrible event. And 2020 was a year of omens. And if you, <laughs> yeah. So if you go through my podcast, Bible Study for Progressives, I do talk about my omens in them, particularly omens on impeachment. And I know I talked about this. I had an omen about the pandemic, but I also had an omen about the coup, or more accurately, on that one, I did a tarot reading, and you can get that on my podcast. It's called Will Trump Concede and Leave? A Tarot Reading. And I did a tarot reading and more of a test, you know, kind of like, let's see if these cards really say anything. So it really wasn't me predicting it as much as the cards, but I got, I got the number of deaths well, right. Well, I, we gotta re, we gotta rewind we gotta rewind a little bit because uh, I want to make sure that people truly understand defining progressive Christian or Christian progressive. What exactly does that term mean? Okay, so I discovered it at Claremont School of Theology. My father was going there. He invited me there. And that's where I discovered progressive Christianity. So it's not like I came, I returned to the faith of my childhood, but I did return to my roots. So I decided to go down one path more deeply because I found I was dabbling, going down a path a little ways, not really taking anything real deep. And so I decided to return to my roots once I discovered progressive Christianity. Now, progressive Christianity is... A number of things, actually. For me personally, it's 
seeing scripture and faith and spirituality in a social or political context. In other words, this scripture, religion, it's not about personal things primarily. I mean, there are some things people have to deal with death, you know, and we go through all these different baptism and rituals for each passage in life. But it's it's most, mostly political because the Bible is the foundational documents of, of the nation of Israel. So throughout the whole scripture, first they're developing and running a nation. This is what this is. And then the New Testament is a social movement. The gospel is a social movement. It's the gospel. What they're saying is that Jesus, a peasant, someone who was martyred, killed by the emperor, is the divine leader of the nation and of the world and not the emperor. The emperor. I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand. Uh, I'm a little confused. Uh, Are you saying that Christianity is like a living document, whereas it's supposed to be uh, retranslated for the times? Is that kind of like what you're saying? Is it supposed to? That's kind of right. That's kind of right, but not completely right, because when we actually go back to the original text and look at it in its historical context, we find that it actually is about something different than what the church, the theology, the church has developed over the years. So if I have a belief in anything, and of course you have to have certain beliefs, but I say scripture, I've dedicated myself to using scripture as both a path and as a way of spiritual development. And it's also led me down a political path. In my view, progressive Christianity is about social justice and pursuing social justice as a calling, pursuing a just world. That's so what you're trying to you're trying to combine progressive political like political progressiveness with actual Christianity. Uh, for more of a social and a political merge between the kind, two? Kind of. I'm really kind of focused more on scripture myself. I would like to see Christianity become more of a social justice movement. I would like to see Christian Christians out in the streets. Um, I don't and in see some... how you marry those two, though. Um, I don't see how you can... If you say you, you trust the scriptures... Can I ask you why you trust the scriptures? I mean, uh, you're using the same Bible that the Catholics are using or maybe maybe a different translation, but for the most part, you're using the same Bible that most Christians use. How is it that you're coming to a different conclusion than most other Christians? Okay, so the term most other Christians, we have to be careful because there's a wide range of diversity. So when I went back and discovered progressive Christianity, I started reading books by people like Walter Wink, you know, the books from people from the Genesis Jesus Seminar. This is a school of theology. So it's, it's a whole different thing when you start to really dig into scripture and uh, tradition, the traditions of the church. You look at the history of it. I mean, whatever the ch- church is saying the Bible means or is, I go to scholarship. So I attend the American Academy of Religion, Biblical Society of Literature, or something like that, annual. They're scholars. So they're they're examining the historical context, politics of the time, what the scripture was really about. It was really the New Testament is a social movement, a social movement for to recognize for self-determination. That was the genesis or the whole. Old Testament is about self-determination, and the New Testament is about a social movement that says, no, the emperor isn't our ruler. We are, or at least a representative of us is. So Okay. So, so uh all right, I'm I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to because I'm really a little confused, but I'm gonna ask you a few questions and uh try to give me a quick answer. Um do you believe that being homosexual is a sin? No. You want a quick believe? answer? Do you want me to explain? Uh, All right. A well, quick answer is no. Okay. I, I'm just trying to get a sense of, because people have in their mind what Christianity for the most part is. 
and the Bible preaches that uh, homosexuality is an abomination. Not in my so, opinion, and not in a lot of other churches' opinions. There was a split between the church, the modernist fundamentalist split, and so there are a lot of progressive Christians out there, and there are churches that are, they, what do they call it, open and affirming churches that accept gays and lesbians, and a lot of the movements to marry were in those churches, and those are the churches that I go to, rather than yeah. those conservatives ones that, that read scripture in that way. I don't think uh, conservatives, I, I'm trying to have, okay, I've read the Bible four times, front to back, and there it's very explicit, explicit in the Bible that God does not want people committing homosexual acts. Even in the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you look at Romans chapter one, it clearly spells out that God did not want man lying with man and women with woman. Uh, he gave them over to their lust. I don't see how it's a conservative interpretation. I don't think I don't think it's a, a political interpretation at all. I think it's you're reading the Bible for what it is. Anybody who can read will see that the Bible does not have a favorable view on homosexuality. Nowhere can you find that. Well, there's a lot of things when you look at it historically for what's really going on. We have to remember that in the ancient world, slaves were also sexual slaves. Children were trained from a young age to be a certain sexual deviant or a sexual, I don't know what's the word, fetish. They were Children were bred for that. So there really wasn't any individual rights. And the end of, there was no moral agency for the individual. So even the idea of sin as a personal sin, it, it's not there because there is no individual. There is no personal sin. It's all community. You were uh, the son of, you were part of your family, your clan, your tribe. You were your role. So this is a whole different entire con context in which we're dealing with things. There's no concept of homosexuality as we know it today. In fact, much of what is talked about as homosexuality is in many ways abuse. It's rape, it's taking advantage of power structures. Where that, where are you getting where are you getting this from? Um, well if we took a look at Sodom and Gomorrah for example, the crime there is violence. The crime there is rape. It's not sex. Yeah but it's not sexual in, perversion. In, in Romans in Romans it explicitly says that a man lying with a man, a woman with a woman in unnatural ways. It, it, it spells out that uh, God finds this unfavorable for a man to lie with another man and a woman I with think, another woman. I think we're going to have to look at the specific text to add. Then the way I approach is I look at the text, then I do research, and then I start to write, and then I come up with my ideas. So if we don't have the text that I'm actually looking at, and second, and then there's another thing. How do we interpret? How should we interpret? There are a lot of things in the Bible, a lot of things. Should we not allow a woman to, should we not allow a woman who has been raped to, should we require to marry her rapist? Should we require, there's a lot of things in the Bible and we don't follow all those things. Well, Even that's, Christians that's, don't. that's a testament to the fact that uh, secularism and other religions have held Christianity's feet to the fire. It's nothing in the Bible that condemns any of those things. It's just Christians not following those things anymore. But no, those things, yeah, they're not following those things. And what it's what I would say is that what you choose to follow out of Scripture says more about you than it does about the Bible, because the Bible says a lot of things. It's an ancient, sacred, blood-soaked book. For God's sake, you know, take it seriously. You know, it's a dangerous book. So you have to be careful about how you interpret it. So if you interpret it in a way that oppresses people, you're outside the context of the whole of Scripture. In other Interpre words, there's, interpretation, there's a interpretation is what we would consider to be a true no Scotsman fallacy. If it's all up for interpretation, who has the right interpretation? How do you prove that you have the right interpretation? I'm pretty sure there are plenty of Christians right now will say that you're twisting the Bible for your own means and your own political ide ideology. And how could well, you go about actually proving them wrong? Well, that's a good question because the Bible is so complicated and complex. And 
the study of it. I mean, there are libraries full of books who have people who have studied the Bible, ancient history, archaeology, sociology, and looked at that ancient world and interpreted the scriptures in that context. So I don't think that basically you can like pick what do they call that when you just pick a scripture and then you say this is what the Bible says. Oh, well, but you, you have to take the whole, pull it out of context. Right, pull it out of context, right. And and not really take the whole of Scripture, the sum total, what is the direction? If God says do not kill, then those passages that say kill, I got a problem with them. Well, right, that's the, that's the problem with the Bible in itself. The whole Bible is out of context. Christians say all the time, don't take this thing out of context. But we already know we're not dealing with a full, complete Bible. There are scriptures missing. There are books completely omitted and, and left out. Uh, there are passages that have been added completely to the Bible. So in order to actually follow the Bible, you're already starting from a place out of context. Right, but I'm not following the Bible necessarily because I'm interpreting the Bible. I'm reading it for spiritual edification. So if I took a work of poetry, I wouldn't read it literally. I would read it metaphorically. And so that's what the Bible really is. And really, I think that to prove that, you have to come to my, view my podcast. You have to come to my Bible studies. You have to read my articles. I mean, because at each point I deal with scripture and I, I do the analysis. And that's why it's hard to take sort of a general reference to passages in Roman, which I think you're referring to but I don't have the words up. I'd have to look at it, then yeah, research I can, I can it. Find it. I can find right. it for you. I right. Know. And then research. But it, the bottom line is that the ancient Ooh. world didn't have a concept of homosexuality as we do. And so those passages Ooh. apply to a totally different context. And also their focus is on violence and oppression, not on sex. So even the Sodom and Gomorrah's focus is on violence and, and oppression and abuse. And and we got to recognize that this was a structure where you didn't choose who you had sex with um, as far as a woman goes. And so it's a completely different social context in which they're talking about sex. So it's hard to make the transition from that to the modern world, just like it's hard to make the transition from somebody touching the, a mountain, a holy mountain, and then deserving the death penalty, or a woman who didn't scream loud enough when she was being raped or children who should be killed for disobedience. It doesn't really work in our culture. And maybe it was wrong even then to put it in there. My view is the Bible contains both good and evil. So even if you find a passage in there that is evil, well, yes, we can learn from that passage still. We can learn what not to do, how not to use religion, or what those oppressive systems were and how they functioned. Why why keep religion at all? Why why bring Christianity along for the ride at all? Because it seems like if you can just in, reinterpret the Bible however you see fit, what good is it? What, I mean, but it's, a, it's not however I see fit because I'm doing research. I'm relying on research. I'm relying on authoritative sources, um, scholarship. That's what I'm relying on. But what so do I'm you not, have that the Catholics didn't have that makes you right versus them being wrong? Well. You know, Kat, you're talking now about the theology of the church, right? The theology that I left when I was a youngster. I was a, grew up in an evangelical family background. So the orthodoxy, which is something that the church has created, not something that is in Scripture necessarily. There are certain things, original sin, not in Scripture, probably not even involved Adam and Eve. Sin isn't even mentioned until Cain and Abel. So a lot of these things that come out into the are open to question. They're open to looking at and reconsidering. We don't have to believe everything that the church tells us. We have the Bible ourselves. We can read it ourselves. We can research it ourselves. And we can come out right. and so, find more accurate views of what they were talking about let's, let's than tradition tells us. Let's be more specific because you say uh, that for for example, you just referenced that Adam and Eve didn't have their original sin, that it wasn't until uh, Cain and Abel. Now, I've never met any Jewish person who would agree with you on that. 
Uh, it seems like even the Jewish scholars adhere to the, the, the scripture as far as Adam and Eve uh, disobeying God in the Garden of Eden, and that was the original fall. Now, whether they mean that literally or just metaphorically, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's widely accepted that if there was a first, the first sin, nobody starts at Cain and Abel. Everybody starts at Adam and Eve. Where are you getting anything different? Can you give me a reference or anything that I can refer to to actually argue that point? Well, John Dominic Crossan, um, who is a scholar in um, biblical studies, has identified violence as the original sin not disobedience. How so, is he doing uh, this? Well, take a look at the scripture. There is no mention of sin in the second creation narrative, which is the Adam and Eve story. There's no mention of sin. But when you get to Cain and Abel, God says to Cain, sin is lurking at your door. So there may be a reference to a demon there, but that's where sin comes in. Human violence, killing one another. You know, we have traditions of the church. You know, I've already rejected those traditions. I, I find church to be a waste of time. But I'm looking at scholarship, historical, people, historians, you know, like the Jesus Seminar, theologians, other um, high-level authors, reading their research, what they say about the Bible, because it's not just reading the Bible. you got to read what other people say about it. I mean, there's, there's a whole tradition of scholarship that maybe is a little bit outside the church. You know, you've got yeah, those, but some of those scholars. You say you have a podcast, right? And you right. discuss some of these things all the time. But I need more concrete evidence or at least give me something solid that I could actually, like you're saying that you're studying these scholars or whatnot, but I, I would assume that you're prepared to lay out an argument on why you have the right interpretation of the Bible, or at least the right view on how to see the Bible, because I'm really not understanding your your case for this. All I'm all I'm really getting is I have a different interpretation. That's really all I'm getting from this, and I'm not really seeing what is behind all of that that causes you to have a different interpretation. Hmm. So I so I study the Bible. I read the text, and you know, I've always had a different interpretation. I remember when I was in the evangelical church, listening to the pastor's sermon and thinking to myself at the end, that passage doesn't mean that. So there's always been misuse of scripture. There's a huge misuse of scripture in the church. And the rigidity with orthodoxy is not consistent with the historical evidence that the that scholars have pointed out so it's not necessarily that in other words the theology of the church is inconsistent with scripture well so you, that's, you do realize that's that they would argue that you are doing the same thing that you're claiming they're doing uh what you're doing is a, a no true scotsman fallacy you're Look, saying it's, it's it's too complicated to i mean i'm not sure what you're actually looking at i mean I've told you that I look at it in the historical context, that in the historical context, this was about a political movement. This was not about personal salvation. It was not about things like that. There was no individual. This was a political movement, both Are in the Old Testament Jesus? and the New Testament. Jesus was a political movement, a social how, movement. How so when Jesus was, uh, Jesus was the one that said, take no care for tomorrow. Jesus was Where also is, the one that said, give on the Caesar what is Caesar's, give on the God what is God. He completely separated the two from each other. Oh, that's, that's totally false, okay? Oh. So, okay, so you've got them going in, and he says, what type of coin do you have? What do you have? What's the image on it? This is idolatry to for a Jew to have a coin with an image of the emperor on it. This is idolatry. That's what he's pointing out there. And then the second thing is, everything is God's. Everything is God. God rules everything. There is no what Caesar. God is the ruler of the universe. He's the ruler of the world. He's the ruler of all the nations. God is has everything. Nothing in the universe belongs to anybody. So the whole saying that it's, it's ironic because basically he tricked them from saying 
They wanted to say don't pay taxes or do pay taxes because that was a trick question, right? If he says don't pay taxes, then the Roman authorities are after him. If he says do pay taxes, then his followers and a lot of the Jews who don't are unhappy with Roman rule will attack him. So he found a way to respond to their question that didn't result in that. So it's it was not an attempt to separate because if you read through the whole scriptures, there is no separation between religion and politics in the ancient world. Okay, the, the so ancient, you would say that all the rhetoric about Jesus coming back in the clouds and him going to prepare a place which is in heaven with his father and all of this spiritualism uh, that he spoke about, you would say none of that was really spiritualism. That was all some mystery of speaking in political code or something? Well, yes, in some ways. I mean, first of all, if you look at the book of Revelation, it's the 666 is supposed to refer to Nero. So there you go. Symbolism. This is a track against the Roman emperor of that time and the cruelty of the Roman emperor. Now, it's made in this apocalyptic sort of fashion, but it's a very political document. John Why? Of Patmos, Why? John, John, we, John don't, of, we don't write our constitution that way. We didn't. We don't write the Bill of Rights that way. Nobody writes political. Polit, nobody writes down their political movement in such a way that is totally spiritual. Uh, it doesn't reference supernatural beings and talk about resurrections and dying and coming back three days later. Like, where where is all of this woo woo coming from? Why is it necessary, and how does it accomplish what is what, what you're saying is trying to accomplish? Okay, so religion in the ancient world was the religion is the first political system. There is no politics separate from religion. Religion is a structure. God, emperor. In most ancient Mesopotamia and the Roman Empire, the authority structure was God and the emperor ruled on behalf of God. The emperor was divine and was, in a way, a god, and many of the ancient Mesopotamian kings were gods. So this is a political system from from the get go, and it's not it's not separate. It is the first political system, and this is a social structure, and it authorizes or justifies rule by some cases a tyrant, but rule by a king, rule by the emperor, because that's where their authority comes from for okay. rule. So you don't think Jesus was an individual? No, I do believe Jesus was an individual and that he did die and was executed. And I think there's evidence for that. And I, But I do think, yeah, so he was a real person. But who he was in scripture, I mean, the things written about him and what they say, a lot of that are stories that were written 50 years later, in some cases 100 years okay, later. Okay, I agree with you. I agree with you, but... Do you think Jesus died and came back to life? You know, Did Jesus die for your sins. Those are two separate questions for me. Yeah, for me, yeah. they're two separate questions. Answer okay. them separately. Okay. Okay. So the first question is I don't know. Historians say they can't do that. They can't say whether somebody came back to life because it's a miracle. And as a historian, you just can't say a miracle happened. You have to base it on. Um, facts and what is possible because everything's a probability. So the ad, the bottom line answer to whether Jesus rose from the dead is I don't know. Does it matter? It's really to me just a symbol of the a peasant, a guy executed by the emperor, becoming the god of the very emperor that executed him. And that's really what rising from the dead means to me. I don't think you're a Christian. And the reason I say I don't think you're a Christian is like because Christianity is based on the Bible. Like you say, you're basing your beliefs or at least not your beliefs, but you're basing your ideas on the Bible. But yet the Bible is also the same doctrine that says if Jesus didn't die for your sins, then it all be for nothing. So, well, yeah, that, not, I okay. see. I know we have to interpret these things as metaphor. In other words, Jesus died for sins, metaphor. That's is it convenient. is that's so right. convenient? Well, it's not so it's not convenient. It's actually a better way of interpreting the Bible because whether things to me, whether Jesus died for his sins does nothing. 
okay, well, are not sins. Because the second answer to the question is I believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. In other words, Jesus died as a martyr, as somebody who went up to fight the powers and who was lost his life for it. But this martyr, for some reason, whatever reason, what came to represent all martyrs and does represent all those who have lost their lives in pursuit of justice. Um, really? But, Where, where'd you get that from? Well, that's well, what else would Jesus be doing? He's going to the center of power. He's come in a protest where they've laid things on, on a donkey. He's uh, upset them by protesting in the temple about the money changers. And so they're after him and they go kill him. This is a very political event. These are about, it's about the nation of Israel. It's about the rulers. It's about the powers. It's about the struggle between the poor and those who have. This okay. is a political All right. document. All right. So what, what is so, okay. What is the political interpretation? Jesus saying, I go to prepare a place for you. No man can get to the father unless he go through me. What does that mean? What is the political implications of that? Okay, so the father, I guess, is the authority figure, but I look at it as the I am statement. You know, God said, I am that I am. And it's sort of, for to Jesus, that is, I am. That's just the confusion of saying Jesus is God. Jesus, I don't believe, would ever have said that to anybody. In fact, in Mark, he tries to keep it secret uh, because, hey, it's blasphemous. But... Yeah, that's how I see that. that so you don't think to say I and the Father are one? Well, kind of saying I and we. I mean, it, the I am is within us. So it's kind of like the God within us. So no one gets through the Father but through me. But also you've got Jesus as the cross. But I, you know, on that one, I haven't studied that one as deeply as some of the other ones. Uh, but I do think that just by saying it's through me, no one gets to the Father through me. You have to read that metaphorically. You know, it's not about belief. It's about action, right? Okay. And Jesus is so, going to die on the cross. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, a supernatural being who created the entire universe? Okay, so that's... What is God? Is That's a large question. And if God created the universe... Is God whatever created the universe? If the universe was created? I mean, it's really hard to use this to say that there's any physical interaction, but something created the universe, some force, some power, and quantum physics has shown us that things are very bizarre. So is there a God that created the universe? I think maybe there's this idea that oh, the universe is consciousness, and that's why I think it's expanding. Um, because the universe is conscious, we may be just figments of God's imagination. But whatever the case is, I'm not sure that I, I'm definitely not a creationist. So mm -hmm. it, whether, and I'm not sure whether believing in that does anything for anybody. Whatever really. that is, do you believe that Jesus was the son of it? Whatever it is you believe that got us here. I believe we are all children of God. And that Jesus was, now they say, the son of God. Well, because he gave his life. I mean, there's no act more meaningful. I mean, to give your life for a friend was the most, the biggest act of love anybody could do in the ancient world. And to give your life for others, for justice, that to me is as close to God as you can get, I think. So whether Jesus was I, I tend to read these things metaphorically. Um, I tend to read them as a story that has what meaning. Literally. What, what is it in the Bible that you consider to be literal? Let's start there. Wow. There is one. There are some things that I do take literally. A lot of the things about the supernatural in many ways that describe the supernatural. Paul's discussions of his experiences, I believe he had those experiences. Now, do I believe that they those experiences were what the church says they were? Or do I believe what that even what Paul says they were? But I believe he had some experiences that um, like the road to Damascus, because I've had that type of experience. 
And I believe he had that type of experience. Now, mystical experiences are human experiences. Humans have had mystical experiences throughout time. So, so it's not, not unusual. Necessarily Jesus that came down and spoke to him in a in a in in the way that Paul said it was. You think it was just maybe he had an experience, but it wasn't necessarily tied to a reality of the supernatural. I, I don't think I would say that. I think I do believe it was a supernatural experience, but I'm not really I don't really think that believing that is gonna make a person do any, I mean, you have, it's all about action, not belief. So, but I do believe he had those experiences and I do tend to think that they're su were supernatural. And if anybody could come down right from, if a ghost, whatever, certainly Jesus could, but whatever it was, it was spirit. I, I tend to, rather than God, I tend to I'm use the word spirit. Okay, when I asked you, did you believe in like a God that created the entire universe, which was a supernatural being that created the universe, you didn't necessarily say that you did. Uh, you were more of, could be a consciousness. Could, yeah, so you kind of didn't say you believed in God as a supernatural being that created the universe. You say you're not a creationist. And if that's the case, but you also believe in the supernatural uh, mm -hmm. as far as uh, Paul having, where does that supernatural come from? What is the source of the supernatural? Okay, so you're asking me to really speculate because the real answer is I don't know. I don't okay. know. Yeah, I'll we take your speculation. I'm just trying to really understand what it is you actually believe. Well, I can tell you what I've experienced and I can tell you uh, why I um, have take the positions I do. So I've done paranormal investigations. I have my own personal experiences with omens. I've had my own personal supernatural experiences. That's where I base most of my spiritual, um, supernatural things. Like I like to, I refer to what other people might call God. I refer to as spirit, you know, like the great spirit of the, of the Native Americans. So I'm sort of a universalist in this respect. Too, because I, I believe all religions are equally valid. So the supernatural, where it would come from, I think if we look at quantum physics, like the idea of consciousness is making up the universe or that spooky action at a distance where two things are connected and they're starting to feel the universe is more like a neural net. Also, just there may be different dimensions, uh, different but universes. what is the source of all of that? What is the source? What okay. causes those things to exist? Well, I, I, yeah, boy, wow. But the, the thing is, is that I sort of see spirits as sort of like gravity, right? Gravity is not, it's not like one of the powerful sources. It's a weak force, right? Opposed to electromagneticism and others. So why is that? Well, some people have theorized that it's because gravity doesn't entirely exist in, in our dimensions, that the most of the force is somewhere outside of the, of the universe. So spirit is kind of like gravity. I, they're here, but they're not really fully here. So the idea that these demons can somehow control us and so forth, not that often. Um, they're actually weak. There is some other realm out there in which, and also here in part, that they exist in. And, and I would have to say that while we don't know what they are, I think the evidence is out there for that they do exist. We just don't know what they are, where are they actually coming from. And, and you don't um, know the source. You don't know the source. Right. Don't, don't, even, don't, don't even know what they are, really. You just so, oh. all right, I, I'll be honest. I'm gonna be honest. Mm -hmm. I, out of all the Christians, uh, all the spiritual people I've ever spoken to, you have confused me the most. I'm just gonna I'm be sorry. honest with you. Uh, I, I feel like everything is some things are literal, some things are metaphorical, depending on how you interpret it. These people have the wrong interpretation. I don't believe in God, but I believe in spirits, or I'm you do you do omens and tarot readings, but also you're a Christian 
that somehow doesn't believe Jesus literally died and rose from the dead, uh, which... Uh, I do believe he died. I do believe he died. But you don't believe he rose three days later and walked around? I don't, have, I don't have a belief about that. I, you know, it could be true. It could not be true. You know, there's a story in, in Matthew that says that the graves broke open and the dead were walking. So uh, these things are more uh, metaphor, myth, and storytelling, but they're meaningful myth. They're, it's the world's greatest literature. It's, it's read by billions of people around the world who follow it. It's a dangerous, blood-soaked, sacred text that demands to be read if we're going to save the world. Because it's not about personal salvation. It's about being a light to the nations. It's about saving the world. So that's what the Bible is about. God said to Abraham, be a light to the nations so that all the nations can see what it means to be ruled by do God. That, do you take that literal or do you take that metaphor? That, no, that's literal. Be a light to the how nations. Do you know, should, how do you know that's literal? Because we can all be a light to the nations. Every nation should rule in a just and and fair, equitable, in a just way. It's, um, so that's what it means to be a light to the nations. So you're being a light to the nations by setting the example of what it means to be a good ruler, to be a good society, to care for the needy, lift up the lowly, reach out to the outcast, help the widow, the orphan. These are what a good society and a good nation does. And that's how you be a light to the nations. That's why you take it literal, because you like yes. it sounds. You, you think it's a good thing to live by, but that's why you take it literal? I take it literal because that's the whole um, message of Scripture, is um, to create a world which is just and loving and kind and caring. And that world has to be uh, ruled from the very, very top. All right, we're gonna we're gonna answer some questions. I'll, I'll be honest, and I'm gonna let you get a word out there. Then we'll answer a few of the questions that are coming okay. up on the screen. But I'm confused. I've never been this confused in my life. I I I, I think I'm a pretty intelligent person, and I feel yeah. like I'm not necessarily upset about it because I don't feel like you're taking people down this path of toxic uh, religion mm -hmm. or hurting anybody, uh, at least from what I hear so far. I don't know everything about what you teach. But so on one hand, that's fine with me. On the other hand, it seems like you're taking all the stuff that you want personally and you're rejecting anything that doesn't fit your criteria or what you want in your worldview. No. I, I mean, at least that's the way. But yes seems. and no. Yes and no. I mean, I do <laughs> that. But at the other yeah. hand, the Bible is there and it's it's there. It's fact. And I use it. And the history is fact. And and the literature that I read, the textbooks that I read, they're there. I'm so glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because I got a question for you right there on the screen. Uh, the uh, Aaron Charitier wants to know what books have you read on quantum physics? You know, I haven't read that many books on quantum physics, but I have, you know, I follow the news and I have read some books and I, I was sort of interested in that for a long, for a while. And I haven't pursued study in science as much, but I have not. I'm not a scientist. I'm a lawyer and I, um, a writer and maybe a philosopher, but I'm not a scientist. So I read, um, I follow that. I know about the general, um, some of the things that have been very confusing. And the main point is that with quantum physics, really anything almost is, is possible um, when we look at that. I think with the reality, where does it come from? Where do we come from? Why are we here? What's outside of the no universe? Maybe there's no why. Maybe that. Maybe we shouldn't even be asking the question. But uh, we're gonna try to keep the answers as short as possible because I don't. I, I want to be considerate of your time, and also I want to try to make sure I get to at least as many questions as I can. Uh, some of them might not be in the form of a question. Some of them might just be a statement that we can respond to together. You know. Right. Uh, uh, what do I believe? Uh, oh, Tangelo. Grass, so I think you're new. I've never seen you before. Uh, welcome to the Hobby Lobby. Uh, I am an atheist, consider myself to be an anti-theist, but I've been less anti more than I've ever been in my life. So at this moment, I'm an atheist. 
a lack of belief in any deity at the moment or anything supernatural. That means ghost spirits, uh, you name it, that's not material or physical. Jack says uh, you're not a Christian. In order to be a Christian, part of the criteria is to believe in Jesus' death and resurrection. Not true. Not true. Not true at all. There are plenty of Christians out there who don't believe in that. In fact, there's a church in Santa Ana that I've attended that doesn't believe in the supernatural. Uh, Jesus Seminar, they talk about strategic, what they call strategic atheism. You know, that, that, and they were, they were talking about theology and God. That's how they were talking about it. So there, it's not true that person is not a Christian if they don't believe A, B, or C. In fact, Christianity is a self-identification. And the well, my so focus on... Why my, identify as a Christian in the first place? Why not just use a different word? Why use Christian? Well, because I focus on Scripture. I mean, I focus on the Bible. I turn to Christian Scripture in a big way. I do Bible studies. I, I'm a, a spiritual and religious teacher out of Scripture. I mean, but why are you choosing the Bible versus the Quran or uh, the, you know, any other? Right. Scripture? Right. I answered that already. I'm returning to my roots. I discovered it at Claremont University and I decided to return to my roots. And okay. that's what I did. All right. Uh, I hate to say who, who is not a Christian, but I'm sorry. That is the foundation. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, he just uh, he wrote that a little earlier. The sun is the light of all nations. You are just describing sun worship. Well, that's yeah. an interesting analogy. That's interesting. Oh, Tangelo Grasso says that is not the message of the Bible. Yeah, there's a lot of things in the Bible. The Bible is, does not have one particular message. In fact, they left critiques of the their government in Scripture. They the prophets are criticizing their own government. So this is, uh, it's not a book that presents one point of view. It's a book with a variety of books, not just, it's not just one book. It's a bunch of books, all by, many by different authors who have different points of view. So it doesn't present a single point of view. All right. Uh, Iron Chair Till wants to know, did God have any regret in creating the world? Yes, uh, he did. So you do believe God created the world? Well, I would say metaphorically, but what I'm referring to is Noah, where God regrets. First of all, he regretted making the world and created humanity after he saw all the violence and corruption that occurred after that. And that's why he destroyed the world. And then he regretted destroying the world. And that's the story in the myth. And so when we talk about God, I might say, you know, oh, yes, yes, but I, I understand I see God mostly maybe as a spirit, but I don't really know primarily a metaphor for a just ruler. Really yeah, well, these people, a... they see, the thing is, <laughs> is that all these people are caught up in the modernist fundamentalist split, including you, Javier, modernist fundamentalist split from the 1920s. It's such a waste of time. There's no reason to hold anything against people who believe in the supernatural or believe in God because they can fight for social justice too. It's why, not, it doesn't why, make, are you, why are you fighting for social justice? Shouldn't justice be decided by courts of law or uh, it shouldn't be decided by civilians? Civilians shouldn't go out and get mob justice or social justice. Shouldn't that be decided by a process? where people have the right to... What exactly do you mean by social justice, and how does that tie into religion? Okay, social justice is kind of a term that I I don't know how many people have different beliefs about it or different definitions of it, but I think it's just basically justice a, a social, in a social context. I'm not using it in any particular, particular okay. way. Yeah, I, there was I, another question you had there. Uh, um, do true Christians are those who... Who those that yeah. did surrender to Christ, repent their sins, are born again in the Spirit, and follow Him. I think that's uh, the, yeah, that's that, that's the traditional view. Uh, yeah. Do you believe you need a religion for people to do what what's right in the world? No, no, you don't need religion. In fact, it's been proven that sometimes religious people are not good either. So absolutely not. So absolutely, I, in fact, 
I would implore you to just drop the religion altogether. I don't see a See, reason. that's that's the mistake. That would be a terrible mistake because Christianity is growing throughout the global south. It's hugely political. It has a huge impact on our politics. We need to uh, do something about that. Secondly, you know, it's not going away. It's not going away anytime soon. And it third, it's a work away. of it right, the third, it, It's ahead. a work of great literature. Fantastic literature. I'm not saying Very meaningful. That, I'm not saying we should get rid of the Bible. I'm just saying that you don't have to identify as a Christian. You don't have to. Well, yeah, but that, why would you do that? I mean, the whole thing is to eliminate prejudice, to eliminate the prejudice of people who have anti-Christian and anti-religious, who harbor anti-Christian and anti-religious sentiment. And so, I don't to think say, so. I don't think. Most I think most atheists, anti-religious or anti-Christian. I think most I think most, most atheists. Who I are now most, believers were harmed by somebody due to religion or were justified based on their religion, and that causes some tension between the two. But I think, it's really a out. It's really a, a backlash from how religion has treated non-believers. I think you're. I, the, I think I. I don't think so. I think there is a backlash, and I think people, but I also think there are people who think that somehow religion, Christianity, and the Bible is the cause of all evil in the world, and it's just not true. Christianity is actually at the, the, yeah, but a lot of people think that, and and in the atheist community, and somehow religion or believing in the supernatural somehow has these de deleterious effects just, on people. I'm just the simple fact that based on the Bible and I'm not just speaking based on the Bible, from the Apocrypha, from uh, historical context, even uh, Judaism. I don't see where you fit in on any of those things. I don't see how well, any you're of just not, that you're I just not in, Right, but you're not, you're just not aware of those interpretations. You're not well, aware of, of them. That's, that's it. I mean, if you read, the, go to the theological school libraries, you'd see books full of uh, whole tons of writers writing about the social justice the, and the political context in which Jesus and what he was actually saying and what he was actually doing with that social movement on the ground and what the scriptures are actually about. But what and does that have to, how does that square with you doing uh, omens and tarot readings? Uh, that's witchcraft. Um, the Bible doesn't condone any of that. How do you square those things? There's a lot of things in the Bible, as I said. There's things in the Bible we don't that are prejudice. We see prejudice against women, as you pointed out, prejudice against gays, and I don't doubt, and I think there's also prejudice against pagan people in the Bible. So there's well, a I lot. Know. So if it's, if well, it's because, a good place to go to get your social justice uh, message, why? Why are those things in there? How does that benefit you? Because the world is not perfect. In fact, the world is in many ways, has a lot of evil in it, a lot of death, a lot of destruction, a lot of murder, and that's in the Bible too. So it's not like we're dealing with cases, some idealistic it's world. It's those things, though. In a lot of cases, uh, it's condoning the, the harm of women. Some or, cases, mm -hmm, some cases it does. That's like absolutely right. Right, right. Slavery, there was so uh, some mention of slavery. Of it's not just bringing awareness to it. It's actively condoning people to participate mm, in some of these No, things. no. Bible Bible really doesn't do it, condone anything. It's just a book. But it's the people who read it who do those things. So God and, didn't tell the stone people on the Sabbath? That wasn't a command? That was just people reading that yeah. into the Bible? No, that was a command. There's evil in the Bible. I have no doubt. And all those stoning deaths... And God goes, it's weird because in the Old Testament, God sort of is said to tell them to kill people. And then on the next day, God says, you have sinned sort of for killing people. So it's kind of like a totally mixed bag. But we got to recognize these people were dealing in their political context like we do in, in a lot of people. They're using their scriptures and their beliefs to justify their actions. And in some cases, those actions were genocide. And that's what we see. In scripture, and so we do. It's a book for a real world. It's a it's real not, world you, book in a real world. Two different things. I, you're you're trying to make it seem like the Bible is just bringing awareness to these things, or just telling you what happened.
But that's not what mm-hmm. the Bible does. The Bible is giving commandments on how to live your life and what the people should follow and do. And it explicitly um, tells people to participate in certain acts because God wants them to, which could be horrific things that we would never condone in our present day society. Okay, so you're totally out of context. You're totally out of context. Okay. So in other words, slavery in the ancient world was not the slavery of the antebellum period. I never said okay? it was. I never said it right? was. So we I'm- have to recognize that. Secondly, you're dealing in a context in which slavery was wildly, just completely everywhere. And so how does a person deal in their own social context with social justice issues? You know, they deal with it with at that time with the context that they have. Today, I'm not talking about say, how they dealt with it. I'm talking about what God, right, right. how God told them to deal with it. It's a difference between okay. what they were doing. What, what, what makes you God think God told them it. anything? What makes you think God told them to do those things? Just because it's in the Bible? I mean, well, the Bible is, is just a book. Neither one it's of us. It's an ancient sacred liver book. Yeah, but religious book. that same book has caused a lot of people to do horrific things. It has. Blood-soaked. Dangerous book. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. But so something dangerous. I don't see why you're... How do you know because it, that because it's not Because it's blood-soaked and dangerous. Should you stone somebody on the Sabbath? Is that literal or metaphorically? Um, well, I don't know where... I guess it, it does tell people to stone people for certain reasons, and that was the law of the Jewish nation. Should we have it as the law of our nation today? Absolutely not. But it was right. the law of the Jewish nation. I keep hearing this argument that slavery wasn't the same, and Jakes brings that up. Uh, how do you know slavery was different? And I'm going to explain a little bit. The argument is usually that the slavery that you know in America was nothing like the slavery back then. Uh, and usually the people who make that argument is saying that, okay, well, it wasn't... I, I'm not going to speak for you. I'm going to let you explain what, how slavery was different, and then I'm going to... well. Basically, slavery was an economic institution. Slaves had rights, some rights. In fact, some slaves were actually leaders. The story of Joseph in the Old Testament, Joseph became an actual government administrator as a slave. So while slavery was not good, it wasn't good, but it was it was an, more of an economic system than it was, and it was a system of oppression and abuse. But it's not like the slaves in the old you South. Were allowed to, nothing. You were allowed to beat your slave. Uh, you so were allowed was, to kill your slave. You were allowed to uh, sell your slaves off. Uh, I, I, I believe in the Bible that also says that if a man earned his freedom, uh, that wasn't him freeing. If he had a family while he was enslaved, he wasn't able to uh, stay with the family unless he stayed in slavery. Um, mm-hmm. that, yeah, that happened. Yeah, yeah, but that that happened even with our slavery. Yeah, so, so slavery was not good. I mean, the whole story of e- of the Jews escaping Egypt was a very story of escape from slavery, escape from pr- oppression. That's how it's been interpreted. That's how even s- slaves saw that and said, "Wow, this is a story for for us to escape slavery." Uh, about how bad slavery is. So the Bible is not condoning slavery. It's just saying, hey, that's it's a reality. How do we deal with it? And that's what Paul's doing. He's saying, okay, slavery is a reality. But what did Paul say that led change the whole world forever? He said, no more Greek Jew, no more slave free, no more uh, men or women. You know, now, uh, that, that changed that the whole world. That was literal or metaphorical? That's um, literal. That's literal because well, I basically, take that metaphorically. well, metaphorically too, it could be. But basically, <laughs> the idea you have to look at Come it. On, you have to look at you have to look at it in its context. In other Come words, on, if a person was just his role, right? They're just mm-hmm. their role. They don't have individual agency. They don't. They're not. They are the son of. They are a slave. That's their identity right there. And that's all they are. So when you say no slave and no free and no slave, you're saying about a person's identity, about who they are. 
And that's what Paul is talking about. There is no, this is no, this hierarchy. It's very hierarchical. You know, Paul you is the your same place. one that said women shouldn't speak in church. To that's wait, right. He said that. To wait till you that. get home and ask your husband. It I'm not going to justify that. So I'm how, not going to justify that. You, you, you I mean, I can tell you what Paul. You take what not taking what you, what, you, no, what you no, want. not at all. Not at all. I'm taking the, the whole and interpreting like it through the whole. No, you want to pick certain passages that are problematic, and there are tons of problematic passages in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's what makes it dangerous. That's why you should read it, because there's tons of problematic passages in it that we need to deal with. The I read it four times. Right, right. So, so those passages are there. Um, and, you know, what do you expect from an ancient sacred book? I mean, it's freaking... 3,000 years old, 2,000 years old. What do you expect? I mean, if it's the work of God, I expect it to be per perfect well, but, in all its ways, but... No, no, it's not. The, it's a work of human beings. I'm not attacking the Bible. What I, what I right. am confused about is how are you getting your worldview from the same Bible that I read and many others have read? I don't understand how you're possibly coming to the conclusion okay. that... So, okay, so you see how the Bible has um, supported conservatism, right? And you see that. You've pointed that out. Um, it's another one of your um, commentators commented how the Bible supports socialism. And yes, it supports conservatism and it supports socialism. And then if you read this book that I have here, um, Inventing the Individual, Oh, you might not be able to see it, but it's called Inventing the Individual, The Origins of Western Liberalism by Larry Seidenthal. So the Bible is also the foundation of liberalism. Everything comes from Scripture. Everything comes from Scripture, from Christianity, because that's the origins of the Western world from Constantine on. And we were Christians and everything was Christian until basically the Enlightenment and even then afterwards. So everything in our society, moral values, um, truth, ideologies, they all come out of the scriptures. They all are based in scriptures. All right, I, I must admit, I, I was not prepared for this. Uh, I, I must admit, I, I wasn't prepared for this, to be honest with you. Um, I'm well, that's not, you, okay, because you don't have to win the debate. You don't have it's to not win about, the debate. It's not about winning the yeah. debate. I'm, I want my listeners and the people watching to have a clear understanding of exactly what you believe and what you're defending. And part of actually having a conversation is for me to uh, flesh out what exactly you do believe and based on what. That way we can kind of have an understanding on why you're right versus why you're wrong compared to what other people might believe. But it seems like I'm not able to really get down to what you really, really believe because it seems like it's all over the place, uh, to be honest. I, and and look, it may be my fault. And uh -huh. it may no, just no, be, no. It, it may just be that I'm not well, understanding exactly what you're saying. Let me let me let me explain because I think what you invited me because you asked me, I said I don't believe in having beliefs, and you questioned me yes. about that. And I don't believe in having beliefs because I don't believe believing things doesn't even. You know, it doesn't make what you believe true. doesn't make what you disbelieve true. What we have is experience. And now, I understand that some people have to have beliefs, and we have to have some beliefs. We have to believe the sky is not going to fall and the floor is not going to fall out from under us. And also, I think people who don't have experience have to have beliefs. You know, you ask me whether I believe in UFOs. I say, I don't know. I've never seen one. But if you ask me to believe in supernatural the ghost, I would say, well, yeah, I have some evidence of that. This has been Bible Study for Progressives. If you enjoyed the program, please subscribe to our podcast or put us in your favorites and write a five-star review. Tell your friends about us and share us on social media. Follow us on Facebook and click the donate button at modernlectionaries.blogspot.com. Your support will help us reach more people, produce more and better shows, and cover the cost of production.
Feel free to send me a note or comment on the show. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, this is Rich Proceda. Thank you for listening.